Okay, welcome back, everybody, to the Thrive Co-Living Communities podcast uh, here on YouTube and uh, almost certainly on your favorite podcast station, audio podcast station. I'm pleased to have with me Jonathan Anderson, who is virtually and physically uh, in Stockholm, Sweden. Uh, He's a uh, co-living consultant and wears several hats. around the concept of community, uh, both in co-living and in the business world. So Jonathan, thanks so much for being with us. I'm really excited to talk to you today. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Uh, really excited about this talk as well. And thank you for the, the lovely introduction. Uh, looking forward to see what we will dive into during these uh, next uh, 40, 50 minutes. Great, so let's let's start out with the different involvements that you have and mm. also include uh, how you got uh, passionate about co-living and community building and just talk about what what you have done and, and what you're doing now. Mm. Okay, good question. Uh, well, I mean, I think if we go all the way back from, from the beginning, uh, me as a person love community. I've always been participating in different team uh, activities, sports, and so forth, and being activated in different like, other curricular uh, activities uh, through and within school and outside of school. And um, all of these uh, football, soccer uh, team practices and continued into my university years where I've been more activated to, to connect with people and organize events and community for people around stocks and investments. Um, and uh, the co-living um, story kind of uh, started not too many years ago. It was actually my last year of my, um, of my master's degree. And one of my friends, he told me about this thing called co-living when we were driving on our way to... Uh, uh, to a midsummer um, celebration, which is a big holiday here in Sweden. Um, and uh, he told me about this thing called co living, and it's business driven, but it's also community driven. And both of these worlds kind of nested into each other, uh, building a company with the benefits of a community for people who live together. And instantly I kind of fell in love and uh, was really passionate about it. So the rest of that trip, um, I, I, I took up my phone and I started Googling co-living Sweden uh, and quite instantly found uh, the place where I live right now and where I am right now, which is canine co-living. Um, and uh, yeah, at that point I was so like falling in love with this new passion and um and was was uh, almost almost dropping off my, my master's degree um i did it uh, <laughs> i continued uh, um and and did my my master thesis about uh, co-living and community living and on that way continued with the research and development projects with a few different uh, real estate and development uh, companies in, in Sweden uh, and have continued through to this day um, with current uh, community programs and so forth for specifically for students. Um, and yeah, I after a, a set of points or after some time, I, I moved into where I live right now uh, and I have been, been living here since then. And uh so you're living in a in a co-living community, and you're working uh, as community builder, I believe, for them. How long have you been at at, at uh, your co-living community? Uh, two and a half years now. Okay. Uh, and ongoing strong. Um, and I think like the 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 emphasis here, and why I felt so much love with this place where I live right now, and also have contributed to the way of thinking about community uh, is the the self-organizing aspects of uh, the way I'm living and the many uh, different uh, contributions I've done in terms of writing articles or 
or being participating on on webinars or or podcasts or so forth. And how many uh, people live in your co-living community? Uh, around fifty people. Around fifty people. Fifty uh, spread out on on four floors, um, and uh, yeah. And um, what was the u was the building built specifically for uh, co living, or was it retrofitted from another purpose? Mm. I mean the the the, the story about K nine co living or its um, holding company the Tech Farm. Um, was that yes so this was from the beginning uh, a hotel for for doctors specifically and it's still owned by the doctors association in sweden but now they're subletting this to canine co-living and we kind of re refurbished and remodeled it a little bit uh to fit a co-living uh agenda uh but more or less i mean the, the all the walls are still there uh, and it, this, this hotel, um, hotel design kind of really fitted with, with the co-living in a way that we really wanted it. Mm. Um, at some point, let's remember, and I'll, I'll make a note to uh, have you show the website or some photographs of it. And mm. I'd like to yes. dig further into, um, you know, the design and, and what, what rooms you have and that sort of thing, what spaces you have, especially community spaces. Um, yeah. And uh, you also mentioned that you have an involvement uh, in a, a business enterprise and you're focusing on com building community within the business. Talk a little bit about that, about that work. Yeah, so that is uh, PropTech Sweden, uh, which is an industry association for property technology companies and, and contact uh, construction technology companies. Um, and what I do there is my position as uh, head of community is really just to create a sense of belonging, community and customer success for the members that are joining this, this network. Um, and uh, PropTech is very much in its infancy in terms of technology development and implementation in the broader ecosystem of the, the real estate and construction industry. Um, and we'll be witnessing, I believe, the same kind of um, process that we see in FinTech. Um, and my, my belief is, and also like the constant, the, the problems that we have with construction and real estate is that, I mean, 40% of our uh, resource uh, resources used on our planet is for building and uh, maintaining uh, buildings. Um, so by by having and technology is a very much of a paradigm shift and have the ability to revolutionize how we think because we need to think otherwise uh, in another way um, and with a new mindset. So by creating a community and and drive for innovation. Uh, between these new technology companies, I think there is the opportunity to really make a dent and, and um, an, um, an impact on the, the real estate and construction industry to mm -hmm. become more sustainable. Um, so we are very much working with the sustainability goals in mind when, when looking at these companies and helping them. So are you, you're building... Uh, how how big is the staff of the organization? It sounds like you're working with the members, uh, the yeah. association members. Are you also mm -hmm. working separately with the association staff to help build a sense of community, internal community, and then broader uh, with the industry members? Yeah, so my, my, my current focus is now with the, the member association uh, but also to to kind of initiate um, uh, activities that would drive kind of community feeling for us who, who actually work at the company um, the difficulty is there is that we all are digital and uh, we are situated uh, our CEO is in London 
Um, our uh, head of marketing is in the southern part of Sweden and me in Stockholm and another one in uh, also in Stockholm but sometimes in the north of Sweden uh, so with those circumstances uh, we will be meeting up like the first time just in uh, in a few weeks uh, which is going to be amazing and how many association members do they have at this point at this point we are we have just reached the 50 member mark uh, and we would just we just started this this association not too long ago, uh, and uh, are seeing some some real growth in terms of membership uh, memberships as well as um, a kind of um, understanding for what prop tech really is, since it is a very new type of term uh, rolling around or uh, in the in the industry. And I would think that. There's going to be some tension there as I think about your members uh, mm. because there, there has to be some competition <clears throat> and overlap between them unless you uh, make sure that they there's only one uh, who does booking reservations uh, that, that you have them only one member of each type. And I would imagine you couldn't do that. So there, no, no. there's going to be some tension, I think, between the competition and uh, cooperation, it sounds like you all have the same broad goal of making housing more sustainable and livable and that sort of thing. Um, do you want to talk about that? And have you, it sounds like you're at the beginning yeah. stages of it, but are you seeing Very some much. of that difficulty? Uh, I have not experienced that myself. Uh, but I, I do agree that there is potential or a risk that that will actually happen. And um, I mean, so we, we do not discriminate in terms of what companies that we take on, as long as they are technology interested and want to drive either if it's a, like a uh, fully, uh, fully technology company or if it's like a construction or real estate company. And um, uh, I mean, the, the difficulties here in terms of competition will be when we are selecting some set of members for some sort of activities uh, where they get the ability to kind of uh, get closer to a client or, or pitch or something like that. We always try to have that, um, the relationship where, where we don't choose, but we always mm -hmm. take in someone else to do that for us, or if it's um, or if it's one of the, the deliverer or the, the buyers, which is the real estate companies and, and the construction companies, we, we, we leave that decision to them uh, to take on that responsibility. So we will not choose between our members, but that's on them. Maybe uh, give a list, a list yeah. of several, pe several vendors who work in a certain space. Exactly, yeah. Well, it's really interesting that you are simultaneously working in co-living co uh, mm. and this, uh, it's, a, it's really a similar but different task um, yeah. within the company. Let's also talk about co-housing a little bit. Um, mm. <clears throat> and I, I told you in, in our pre bit of a meeting that I yeah. really was not aware of co-housing when I started working with co-living, uh, mm. they tend to be in silos, but I know that co-housing was initiated in, I'm not sure if it was Sweden, but I know it was Scandinavia uh, back in the yeah. mid to late sixties. So talk a little bit about <clears throat> what you see as the differences and the similarities of co-housing. And if you can shed any light on that, the origin and location of of co-housing, please do. Yeah, I mean, so when we're talking about co-housing and the origination originated from, um, what I've read is that originated from Denmark in the '60s, and the current uh, the current form of co-housing that we are calling co-housing in today, and um, and I think we have like different types of co-housing spread out. In the uh, in the world, 
uh, for example, the co-housing that we experience in, both in Denmark and in, in the US is very much driven on a um, private basis. So the capital and the resources are very much um, initiated from the members of the community. And they take on so much more risk and also a lot more responsibility in terms of building these communities, both the physical and the uh, non-physical aspects of the communities. Uh, but in Sweden, we did it in a, a little bit of a different way, where uh, many times it was on a state level, but also on a institutional level from the real estate companies and construction companies, where they were very much more involved in these um, in these projects. Uh, so for example, in Sweden, we have still many of these co-housing communities existing, and there's always a collaboration with a real estate company. And the real estate company takes on the risks of as, as a developer and build it, and then they own it and rent it out instead of what you see in the Danish and, and the US models where um, many times you as a community own the place and you have to put in all the capital. So, um, which is also very much um, uh, creating uh, this, this, uh, this divide where which people have access to co-housing and which do not, because you need a lot of capital in Denmark and in the US compared to Sweden where anyone can access these communities. Um, and uh, yeah, my mother, she's also actually moving into to one of these co-housing communities uh, next week. So I'm going to, to Gothenburg to, to help her do the last packing and move in. Mm. Uh, and so are there a lot of these entities and do they, do most of them receive some state support or, or community government local government support? Yeah, uh, I would say like the, the overwhelming majority is uh, getting some sort of support from the real estate companies and, and also the state level in terms of subsidized uh, rents and so forth. Um, but you also see like more and more these co-housing communities that are built on the foundation of the community makes the investment and you own your apartment. Um, and the difference here, not only to mention where the funding comes from, but also how you live. So in the Swedish model, these co-housing places are very much centered in and around the cities um, compared to uh, in the US and, and Denmark, where you many times see them in the suburbs. Um, or rural places, um, which is yeah very fascinating to see these differences. And are are most of them rented out with some with more ownership moving in, um, more of a trend towards ownership. Um, I I I'm not exactly. I mean, I do see some trend there, but I am not. Uh, I'm not really sure that actually, to be honest. Okay. And um, what about the, the demographic of co-living there? If you can generalize, is it, you know, in, in the States and Bali and other places, it's mostly 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Um, yeah. what, what's the demographic look like? Um, for co-housing in Sweden? Uh, or uh, or co-living if we're using them, the terms separately. Yeah, so I mean, co-living uh, have mostly the same demographics as you see in, in the US or in Bali or, or these places, uh, where it's mostly uh, around the 20, mostly like um, uh, millennials and my generation that, that lives there. And we do see, um, example, for example, here in Sweden, we have uh, there was a, a, a report that was made to, to look into the aspects of actually introducing co-living for elderly people and most specifically very um, uh, uh, poor elderly women. 
uh, that would have this, this ability to live together uh, with it for a very uh, low amount of, uh, of, uh, of rent. Uh, um, and so I think that that's something we will, we will see much more, but this is not only in Sweden, this is something that we will witness globally that the, the co-living model will be implemented for different demographics, but currently it is millennials um, and sometimes uh, some single parents um, as well. Um, <clears throat> as you know, from researching our Thrive concept, uh, we're aiming to create a multi-generational inclusive uh, community and have 20 somethings, 30 somethings, I, uh, I believe artists, artists or creative types will definitely be drawn, but also uh, older baby boomers and uh, parents with young children. So we really want to mix it up. Um, are you seeing, are you seeing much of that multi generational and inclusive gay, lesbian, uh, trans? Are you seeing much of that in Sweden? And I, and let me just tell you, I, <clears throat> based on my bias um, yeah. of Sweden as a very progressive place, I would mm. expect it to be a fertile ground for that. Uh, mm. Now, let me see if I'm going to be disappointed. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> good question. Uh, I have one example, which is, um, is situated in the southern part of Sweden in Helsingborg. And can't remember the name but um the space what i which i'm referring to have used a model where they um within the same space where people live they both have like elderly people moving in with refugees uh, and and young people to to get that uh, diversity going and also for especially for the refugees to get a helping hand from the elderly uh, in 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 um, integrating into society, which according to developers and the people that run the place are very happy with the results, um, and they see some uh, some great potential for for using more multi generational and more diverse uh, living spaces, um, and that is something I believe that we will see much more of. Uh, you see these different places in Sweden uh, where they try to incorporate more diversity, not only just environmental sustainability, but the social aspects of sustainability as well. Um, and that's where I believe is the most difficult part, um, where you have people that with a very different mindset living together, very close to each other. Um, you really need the, the foundations for, um, for that community to be sustainable uh, socially and not, and being longevity, having longevity as well. Mm -hmm. um, um, <clears throat> I know in this country, uh, back a couple of generations, it was not unusual for multiple generations to live in, under the same roof. Um, and then we've gotten away from that. Has that also happened in Sweden where families used to live together at least two or three generations and, and they've separated? And now do you sense that there might be some impetus with housing shortages, uh, the expense of housing uh, to come back together? And I, I really see um, parents with young children really benefiting from having seniors right there to help take care of the children and watch the kids and that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah, I mean, going way back when, when you don't have the necessary funds and where there was the social acceptance of uh, families and different generations living together, this, has not, this is not the case anymore since, especially in Sweden, individuality is very highly regarded and is a status symbol um, and as well when you when you factor in the government support of the social system that we have in Sweden and in Nordic countries where 
in many other parts of the world and uh, especially in the poor parts of the world, you need the support of your family because nobody else will help you. The government will help you. So you need that support in order to have the safety net that you need. But in Sweden, all of these things have been outsourced to the, to the government. So by being a single parent, you, are, you, you have the, 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 the support and the, uh, from the government to actually live very happily and, and easy, convenient, um, which, which have, and the consequences of that is, of course, that we have become very individualistic and lonely because we don't need people anymore uh, except for being social. We don't need them for, for the help and the support that we otherwise or in, in the back of the days needed. Um, and then add technology into that where we're, we're on our phones and that's yeah. how we're socializing and then mm. add COVID to that on top mm. of that. Um, yeah. yeah, I Not I really feel like people who did not even value community pre-COVID are going to have a real appreciation for being able to, once we come out of this and come out of the variant, um, that there's going to be a greater appreciation for a sense of community, even amongst people that didn't value it before. Would you concur okay. with that? I mean, I've, uh, I've been reading up on uh the effects or like the the demand for community in in Kolebe. will will the pandemic actually result in people feeling the urge and the need to actually have community more in their lives or will it just go on like the same and i mean the articles that i've been reading uh has pointed towards yes people really felt it when they were so lonely and isolated from other people that they really needed that part of their lives. And now in the, in the aftermath or, um, of COVID or the worst parts of COVID at least, um, I believe when you're not able to get the social aspects from your work and you don't get it where you live and you have all the technology that, you, that, will, that will essentially leave you very lonely because you don't really need to go anywhere. Everything comes to you. Um, then I believe that there will be a strong emphasis and strong need for community uh, in order to stay healthy, um, for sure. So let's, let's really dig a level deeper and talk mm -hmm. about um, both in primarily in your co-living community, but some in, in your association work about how you really build community? What activities? Uh, how do you empower and encourage people to, uh, to generate activities? Um, and especially, let's, let's also earmark the, uh, uh, when in a rental community where you have some, uh, you would have more turnover than if you have ownership um, yeah. in the community. Uh, my, my, my guess is it's going to be a bit harder to get people to take ownership in helping to build community. So just talk about your favorite community building activities, what, what really works. And, and let, me, let me also say, I know I'm adding a lot of layers to this, but, <laughs> but I think in, in our plan for our community, I think that programming is going to be the core at the core of the concept and having activities and a variety of activities on a regular basis that pe people can either opt into or choose not to participate in. But I think the, the frequency of those activities is going to directly relate to the sense of community that people feel there. So let me leave it up to you. I know it's, I've dropped a lot on you, but I'm yeah, sure I right. will like the so if I if I understand like the, the the main objective here is to how do you actually build community and what is the source of creating strong community links between people and um, 
I think there's there's different steps and different parts of that uh, question which I can um, create. I can I can start with saying that I think the foundation of any community is values, um, and that so that is the different difficulties when you have, for example, extreme diversity in a community. Uh, if you don't have shared values, that's going to be extremely difficult to get these people to align and, and being able to, to be uh, progressive and, and make actions and take decisions. Um, so yeah, that's one thing. Uh, second thing is boundaries. Uh, and now these things that I'm mentioning here are uh, to some extent um, what I got from Art of Community, uh, which is a book uh, that, that you can mention afterwards. Um, anyway, um boundaries where you know that where where does your community end and where does it um uh, where, where are your boundaries um and for example in a living situation that is really easy because yeah it's where your, the door is if you have a, a an apartment or a building uh and if if it's <coughs> a, a villa or out on the suburbs it is the, the land that you own or that is uh, connected to this uh, community. So that is something that is also very important and that you also have like social, um, social norms that are agreed upon and that you have an understanding for how to interact with each other, uh, which is also super important. Um, so yeah, these, these are the things that are, are most important, I think, uh, in order to, to create the foundation for a community, um, among other things. Do you think that people, let's, let's, let's assume a multi-generational group for, for a moment. Um, do you think that people self-select? I mean, if they're interested in living in a co-living community, then... Um, just that alone, I would think, would start this set of shared values and that that a single mother and an older person and a millennial, if they if they're seeking that out, they need that, then um, might that solve many of the problems? We're going to have cultural differences. You're going to have generational differences but just the fact that they're selecting to live there and they don't have to live there might and, and it, do you think that's the most important shared value that i want to live in community and participate in community and then that becomes the overarching concept uh Yes, I mean that is that is uh, that is prerequisite in order to, if they have not chosen to be there, um, then uh, yeah, then you're going to have some real difficulties. Um, so yes, I mean the more values that are aligned, or the if everyone can agree on some sort of identity for the members that live there, um, that is going to make the process so much more easier. Um, so yes, I believe that there is, um, there is the ability to actually live close to each other and having separate values, uh, fundamentally. But I also believe that in order to create a, um, a longevity in the community, as well as, uh, the strength and the, the, the ability to actually take actions. So for example, in a company, we all, nowadays, we don't try to get people that are just like each other uh, because you won't take any, any good and perspective, get a, many types of perspectives in your decisions. Uh, so even though you might be very fast in taking decisions, they are not as efficient or optimal. Um, and the same you can you can extrapolate that to a community as well. 
um, you have a different people with different mindsets. And if you have like moral prescriptions that you abide by, that you have agreed on, uh, for example, that and incorporate um, ways of communicating that um, that would not end up in people shouting at each other or uh, or, or 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 getting into a fight. Um, I think that is that is super important. Um, and something that I've been meddling with and thinking as a thought process or a thought game is to when you when you live together super close to one another for example where i live i live in a bunk or a pod uh, and one pod out of four in one room and the one that i the ones that i live with the closest i believe they need to be most like me and the further out you go the more diversity you can have but in a city where people are gravitating towards neighborhoods that are more like-minded people and they will stay in these neighbors. They will just see one part of the city. They will not be able to see the other parts. So I believe you can take a city and you kind of comprise it and come from to, to a very small area where you still have diversity and they're still part of one community, but they have different rings. Um, and so, for example, I think it will be very difficult for a person that is completely opposite in terms of generation, in terms of culture, in terms of value system, to live in the same room. Um, that is going to be very difficult. But I believe that if you have like-minded people living in the same rooms, and then as further you go from the core private sphere, you can increase the diversity. And... Uh, that's uh, how I believe you can actually have a multi-generational home, have a diversity, but also have alignment in values and a foundation for, for community. Because you also have cultural differences. If, if we're coming from different backgrounds, whether it be nationalities or religious backgrounds, we're going to have mm -hmm. some, uh, I think that make, there's, there's more perspectives. So I'm really curious uh, about your your co-living space. And I, I oh, by the way, uh, when I was in college, um, just randomly, I was assigned a roommate and um, yeah. and he was fundamentalist Christian and I was liberal Jewish. And um, we actually got to be really good friends and there was an acceptance there was there were limits and we respected each other's differences and we were miles apart i mean in his particular church they did not sing or have music um in the religious ceremony uh, or celebrate anything that wasn't biblical they didn't celebrate christmas so it was a a very uh different sort but we we really got along well, and we were now we were only roommates for one year, but or mm -hmm. uh, but still. Um, so, talk about without violating any. Uh, I don't know. Can you can you talk about the different personality types in your pod, and how mm -hmm. you manage? Because most co living communities that I'm aware of. There's there's more separateness than that. Each at least each person has their own room. So mm -hmm. talk about how that works, and then let's go ahead and talk about the community spaces that you have in your particular community. Yeah. Uh, so so the space where I live, which is a pod, uh, it's around five square meters. Um, I would say perhaps uh, what would that be in in square uh, feet? Let's say three, uh, three feet to a meter, approximately. Yeah. Okay. So uh, fifteen or yeah, something like that. Fifteen uh, square feet. Um, and um, it's also I can't stand tall in my pod. Um, so I have can't, to say it crouch. again. I can't stand tall. I can't stand up. 
upright uh, in my pod, which I need to crouch and, and bend my head in order to go in and, and move around in there. Um, and um, the, 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 the pods where I live in, it was actually, and, and the place where I live in was part of a, and also funded by the state as a uh, innovation project where they wanted some uh, key uh, areas to be, um, to be researched more and tested and experimented. And the way that I live is part of that experiment where we have like really comprise the private space to very, very small space and see and the, the, the hypothesis or the question was really to see if we decrease the personal space by this much, can we also increase the well-being of these people? So by comprising the personal space, can we increase the well-being? And um, which I believe they actually, they proved it in, a, in an article, a scientific article um, that they could uh, into some, some different types of um, parameters. But the way I'm living here is with people that, so for example, we have four people in this room and all these four people are, in my sense, very aligned in values and beliefs as well as what we want in life. And we are becoming a very tight group of friends. Um, and the reason, and we also have like an interview process in order to get in there, uh, as well as an interview process to get into the house. So the first layer is, yes, we need to be accepted to the house. And then the next layer, because we live so close to each other, we need to feel safe with this person that lives so close. And we are all four sharing a room, a bathroom. Um, so you, have, you do have a bathroom for the four of you? Yeah, yeah. And we have a, a second bathroom that is shared for the whole floor, but there's nobody else using it but us. Um, so essentially, we have one connected to where we live, and then we just go out in the corridor, and we have a second one. Um, but with these people, um, what we're trying to, and why we have these interviews to understand, like, okay, is this a person that we can, that can become a really good friend to myself? Uh, and no matter what, if I would live with this person or not, I would still be a friend with this person. Um, and that created like something almost like a family. Um, I do feel that way for the rest of the house as well. But these people that I live so close to, I see every day, I can hear them rolling around in their pod, in their bed. Uh, you create, you have some so high levels of intimacy and um, that, and you able to actually show yourself as a very vulnerable uh, in that space. Um, so yeah, in those cases where, where you live like very, very, very close to each other, you need to be kind of similar, at least to some like very foundational values that you have. So there won't be too much friction between each other. Right. Um, By the way, I did the calculations and I'm not a math person, but uh, mm -hmm. that's 225 square feet approximately. Um, and that that is 56 square feet per person, um, not counting the bathroom. So that's, uh, this is for my American, since we're the only ones that are on, <laughs> on uh, the Imperial standard. And that's 10 feet yeah. by five feet for each individual. And there are some prison cells that are bigger than that. So- Yeah, yeah I definitely. <laughs> um, and I would imagine that you have to be careful. For example, I was very chipper and talkative in the morning and my roommate in that situation just did not want to talk. So you have to be careful yeah. and you probably, probably if you only have one person who's talkative in the morning, then the others are gonna jump on him and make him stop. Is it, is it only, uh, are there only males or is it co-ed? It's 50 50. Uh, so we're two guys and two women. Um, and two women. Wow. Um, and what about, what about your 
eating facilities? Do you have one uh, community kitchen and dining room? Uh, so we have, um, in total, in the house, we have five kitchens um, and uh, one per floor, uh, except the first floor, which I'm right, uh, right now, uh, which we have two kitchens. Uh, one that uh, the people who live on first floor use and one who is connected more to the co-working and the entertainment area, as well as like a wellness area. Um, and on the floor that we live, um, that I live in, which is the second floor, we have the largest kitchen and we have a big library. So we have a lot of space outside where our very small private space, our pod, to, to move around and, and to use. Um, and that is essential uh, in order to, to have so small private space that you have communal spaces where you can use. And do, uh, are there separate co-working spaces or are those spaces also uh, double as co-working and dining and that multi-purpose? Uh, so the big kitchen we have, there's also like a dining area and each and every kitchen has like a dining area or one table or in the big kitchen, it's like maybe spots for like 20 people or 25 people. Um, and um, the, the co-working space is a co-working space during the day. So, um, and during the evenings, uh, it transition into a uh, entertainment space. So that's also where we have like the, the home cinema and um, we also have like like music instruments and instead of working at the tables uh, people are playing um, board games or doing some other activities or some people which is working a lot uh, in, in different startups or so forth they maybe they're working late as well i feel like we we probably should wind down uh and there's so much more to talk about so i hope you will join me again um, why don't we finish up with, let's come back to the core of your work, which is community, building community, and maybe share any other uh, thoughts that we haven't talked about, about the importance of community and how best to build that. Um, mm -hmm. Let's come back to the root of your, of your work to, to wind yeah. up. That's, that's really good, uh, since I haven't talked about it, and uh, which is also the thing that I spend most of my time or thoughts um, in. And that is like the, the self-organizing parts of community. And to we were talking previously about ownership, uh, but then we talked about like uh, financial ownership of, of the building or your apartment or your room. Uh, but I'm also talking about like a um, sense of ownership from where you live. And, um, and here at K9, we, we're using a self-organizing or in the co-living world, we use a system model approach, um, which is in a sense, a way to self-organize and not putting all of these activities on the operator. So in many instances in the co-living world, uh, in the commercialized co-living, we have the operators that are servicing the, the community uh, through activities, events, um, and operational uh, things as well. Um, and the more you can outsource to the community, and if they're willing to, uh, the more ownership they will have. If they, I mean, if you clean your own space, then you will take care of that space way much more than if someone else does that because you don't go through that process. Um, and then this, of course, the question like, how much should you, um, uh, how much service should you actually offer to the community? And how much should you try to get them to, to, to do it by themselves and empower them to become more self-organized? And I mean, when I talk to my industry peers about the engagement, um, and when I, when I compare that to how I live and how people act and, um, and, and live here, 
uh, there is so much like this engagement creates a sense of ownership and a sense of um, are you part of building something that becomes and which is the foundation to community. If you don't feel that this is your place, if you don't feel a sense of belonging, you won't. You don't want first. You don't want to live there, and second, you won't take care of it. And even though you live there and you kind of get along with each other, you don't. You won't really get um, strong sense of belonging and that you are um, excelling and experience and and achieving new knowledge and learning things. Uh, and doing some sort of personal development journey. Um, so I think that is like the, the main topic of creating strong, sustainable, and um, long-term co-living, uh, and as well as co-housing. And do you think it's just build a matter of building a culture that is doing it? You know, and l- let's just say, uh, and I envision uh, and want to encourage everybody within our community to bring their own passions to the group and to have a night where they're sharing whatever they're passionate about, flutes, wh- whatever it is, and mm-hmm. and to find the people that they know that are not necessarily in the community to bring their passions and their interests and their knowledge into the community. Do you think it's a matter of just saying, hey, this is going to make it richer for everyone if we all bring our talents and loves and everything in and building a culture of that? How, or how does it happen? You're, yeah. You've got so, it happening there. Yes. Uh, and I mean, it's all about design. And you need to design the, the right circumstances for that, for those, uh, uh, for that to happen. Um, and I mean, one part is setting a vision and values that are emphasizing transparency, emphasizing um, proactivity and emphasizing people to engage. Um, and also include, so, so that is the most important thing to design the framework for which you enable people to be self-organized. And I've been using um, different types of tools and, and learnings for how to do so. And this is something that you can witness much more in the, uh, in the um, uh, workplace, for example. Um, where there's companies that are trying to, to build a culture where people actually being more self-organized and they use like the design of that is to be transparent to instead of command and control, you emphasize communication and influence. Um, and from this get-go, you, you start with creating the vision, having the strategy for this to be enabled. And, um, and promote people to, to become that. And it was just super abstract, um, but um, I mean, you will learn along the way, uh, but having the trust in the community to actually, uh, to, to kind of cre- to, um, to create these, these circumstances where they can be self-organized. So for example, here, when, when you moved in and when they started, uh, when people, the first people that moved in, they moved into an unfinished place. Uh, the, the space was not finished. And they were part of designing both the, the physical space in terms of painting the walls. If you really wanted, you could help out with that. They were part of designing how they're going to, to live together. What are the values that we want to live by? What are, what are our ambitions? What is our, how often do we meet? Being able, you, you, you empower them to build their own community. And also, and in doing so, you, you should also, if you want to create these self-organizing and emphasize and influence that, you, you need to uh, have a reinforcement system 
that will push them towards that uh, path. Um, so both having values that align with a vision that, that, that do that and also reinforce them through different set of activities or in our case, um, they used a um, uh, house budget. So that is also a great thing. I mean, we had resources that the community on our own could choose what we wanted to do with them. And depending on how self-organized or whatever you want to get out of the community, uh, we were given different amounts of house budgets. So that is just one way to reinforce, but then it's also reinforcing good behaviors or reinforcing um, with like, okay, you guys, you made this, we're going to help you out with this. Um, and um, yeah. Very interesting. Okay, let's, let's wrap up and hopefully you'll join me again. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And we've got so many things to talk about. And actually, let me, let me make a list of a couple of things. Um, mm. You mentioned sustainability, which we haven't really talked about. Um, yeah. both economic and environmental. And you mentioned within your association uh, work that they're focused on making things more sustainable. I'm, uh, I'm incredibly interested in Tesla and mm. what Tesla is doing. And you probably know that Tesla has an HVAC system that they developed for the um, Model 3 that they're going to be at some point when they can get to it employing for home and office HVAC um, that uh, as you pointed out 40% uh, of energy the world's energy is for heating and air conditioning so mm. I think we can talk about that um, and uh, manufactured or pre-manufactured housing I don't know if you've found boxable yet um, but boxable uh, is an a very interesting sustainable uh, concept. It's b o x a b l dot com. If you're not familiar with it, and if my audience is not, we we've, we've done an episode talking about uh, somewhat about Boxable. So and and just the whole building of community. Um, there's just so much to talk about here. So, but I yeah. want to thank you for this conversation, and. Um, it's been very rich. And how uh, do you want to plug your canine? I think it makes it easy for Americans to or, or Westerners to to uh, remember the name. But talk mm -hmm. about your community, your association and the best way for people to contact you. Mm, OK, so um, canine co-living is where I live and uh, is, is, is doing a lot of community building efforts. Um, PropTech Sweden, which is the, the, the industry association for uh, property technology and, and construction technology companies that wants to progress and drive the innovation towards the sustainability development goals of, of the UN. Um, and through these initiatives, you can contact me as well as uh, Coliv, which we haven't talked about at all uh, which is in all the industry association that I'm active and as representing uh, as a Nordic ambassador uh, and to, to to drive the agenda for co-living in the Nordics through events and so forth um, so the best way to contact me I believe is either through my email which is jonathan at co-livinglife.st uh, or through uh, LinkedIn which is uh, co-living life, Jonathan. Um, and I, I, I believe we can put in some, uh, some addresses or URLs to these um, uh, contact information. We'll put those in the show notes and be sure to send those okay. uh, to yeah. us. Sure. So uh, that's how to contact Jonathan and, and he's got a broad uh, breadth of experience uh, in co-living. So, and I believe you, you are open to doing some consulting with, um, with people in the industry, uh, yeah, about, sure. especially around community. Um, mm -hmm. 
Okay, well, let's wrap it up. Um, thanks everybody for uh, tuning into this. And um, I, I do hope to, to talk Jonathan into other episodes talking about different topics. Um, Thrive Co-Living Communities, you can do some research on us at thrivecolivingcommunities.org. Yes, I know it's a mouthful, but, um, and no hyphen in there. Um, you can support us uh, in many different ways, and we'll have those in the show notes. Um, uh, we recently joined Patreon, so you can contribute through that. And that supports not only the podcast, but the building of this community. Um, and uh, do join us. Uh, we're, we're here uh, at least every other week and sometimes more often. Um, and you can find us on YouTube as well as your favorite podcast station. So thanks everyone for joining us. Jonathan, thank you again. And um, thank we'll, you. we'll see and everybody next time. Yes, go ahead. Yes, I also wanted to say thank you very much for, for having me on. Uh, it was a sincere pleasure to to have this this talk with you. Um, very interesting questions, and I'm super interested to hear more about what you guys are doing at, at Thrive Co Living and how you progress into the future. So thank awesome. you. Awesome. Let's do keep the conversation going. If you enjoy our podcast and the concept, there are many ways for you to support Thrive Co Living communities please visit our GoFundMe page to learn more about our philosophy and goals. There you can donate to help us develop our first co-living community or share the link to spread the word about our mission. You can also support us while you shop using Amazon Smile or Kroger's Community Rewards Program. These programs allow you to support your favorite organizations while doing your everyday shopping and give you an easy way to help us grow. Finally, support us on Patreon and receive exclusive first looks at new podcasts, behind the scenes content, and other exciting promotions. We also encourage you to support other sustainable ventures. Check out boxable.com, B-O-X-A-B-L.com, a company that shares our philosophy on affordable, and sustainable living and use our affiliate link to make your purchase. If you're a Tesla fan like me, you can also use our link for Tesla to earn rewards for solar panels or solar roof technology. By using this link, you can reduce the, your energy grid reliance and support clean energy and you get $500 off the purchase of a Tesla solar roof uh, and we get $500 credit towards our purchase of a solar roof. To learn more about the many ways you can support Thrive Co-Living Communities, please see specifics down in the show notes below. Thanks again for your support, and we'll look forward to seeing you on the next podcast.